Mark and Brelandu talking about parsing languages with remix text rules. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to talk about uh, one part of MX text rules. Um, MX text rules is just one of the extension packages that I wrote a long time ago, about 10 years ago, uh, for, for Python. I wrote that in the context of a writing a web application server, which then eventually turned out to be such a success because I could market it. Um, but MX text tool still lives and is alive and is still being used. Uh, I'm going to show you how to use MX text tools for doing fast parsing in Python without going to C. Uh, a bit about myself. I'm Mark Lemberg. Uh, I'm the, the owner and CEO of eugenics.com. Uh, I'm not sure whether you, you know eugenics or a few tools that we have. Uh, in the past, there's a new generation of Python users out there which uh, uh, are, well, maybe don't know the stuff that we've written, like MX Data and MX ODBC, all these things. I've also been a, a Python core developer for a long, long time, and uh, I work a lot on the Unicode support that we have in Python. Um, I was on the Python Software Foundation board for a few years. Um, then eventually things uh, changed on the board and uh, I basically stopped working there. Right, so uh, unfortunately I only have uh, half an hour or two to talk about these things. Uh, the MX text was the, especially the, the tagging engine that's included in MX text was rather complex. So, uh, I'm not going to go into all the details here, I'm just going to uh, skim the tagging engine a bit. If you want to read about more uh, details in the, in the tagging engine, then you should look up on the website, read the documentation, and if you have questions, just ask me. So what was the reason for writing MX Texels in the first place? Um, I used to use regular expressions a lot. But uh, eventually, if you, if you work with regular expressions, uh, you find that at a certain point, things get so complex that it simply is incomprehensible. For example, this is uh, something I took from the SGML lib that you have in the Python Study Library. Um, it's a regular expression for parsing an SGML attribute. And if you look at it, well, you can't really see what it's doing. Um, <laughs> and what's even what's even worse, you, you, you can't see that it's uh, you can't really make sure that this really parses what you want to parse. And that was at the time that was my major problem because it was very hard writing uh, regular expressions that uh, match only the things that I wanted to parse. They very often parse a lot more than I had intended. So I thought it's much better to use an iterative uh, approach for this. So you basically use a state machine and then you tell the state machine to look at the character that you're currently working on and then depending on the, on the character, uh, you tell it to either move ahead or do something else or uh, skip back again, these things. So MX text tools um, contains the, the tag engine itself. Um, because I also do uh, lots of searching for words, I added a few search objects which are specialized for doing uh, word matching in, in strings and large strings. Um, plus, I have a few helpers in there. And now, with uh, MX Text Tools 3.0, uh, we have full Unicode support in the whole package. So, the tagging engine is uh, Unicode aware. I work with Unicode uh, plus all the helpers and search objects that I have in there. Okay, so let's look at how you can use MX text tools, especially the, the tagging engine for parsing. Um, the tagging engine, as I said, is a state machine, which uh, some of you may know from computer science. Um, it's not a finite state machine, so it actually does a lot more, can do a lot more, cause a lot more than uh, what you can do with a finite state machine. Uh, the reason is that I have things in there like callbacks to Python, so for example, if you want to match something in a certain way and you don't have the tools available in the tagging engine, you can always go back and call back into Python and do some complicated processing there. 
because you have access to the context, which means that you know where you are in the stream, you know what you parsed, uh, you can pass in a context object that you can use for uh, having something like a sort of like globals that uh, you have available during the parsing process. So you can use that information to uh, make the whole parsing process a lot more detailed and you can easily write everything that you need. Um, so at the, at the heart of the uh, tagging engine you have the state machine. The state machine is implemented as a very tight C loop and it uses a C switch statement. So basically it works like a virtual machine, like a bytecode virtual machine, um, like the one that you have in Python. And it's uh, highly optimized, so it's very, very fast. Um, you program the state machine much like you would program uh, assembler. That's the uh, not so elegant <laughs> part of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice part. <laughs> so um, while you can write a program as simple uh, as a list of tuples and then pass it to a, a Python function so you don't have to deal with all the, the assembler stuff. Um, it is still a bit difficult to, to write these things. Uh, fortunately, there are a few third-party tools that you can use to, for example, convert an, an EB and F uh, grammar into these, uh, what I call, tag tables. And then you can pass that to the tagging engine, it does all the the hard stuff for you and then you get back the results. So um, on the left here, I don't know if you read that, um, it's, this is uh, uh, basically the program for the, for the tank engine. It's a very simple format. You have, uh, you use tuples in there. Um, you have something uh, I call tag objects. So what you do is you, you match a string in your text and then you associate <coughs> an object with that uh, matching straight. Um, you can use any kind of Python object for that. So you, in this case I use uh, strings, lowercase and uppercase, uh, but they can be any Python objects. Later on I'm going to show how to use uh, uh, classes for that and how to integrate this whole thing into um, abstract syntax trees. Um, then you have, you have certain commands in there, uh, you have arguments for the commands, and you can tell it whether to jump somewhere in the, in the program or not, uh, whether to leave the tag table, which then uh, can either mean that you have a successful match or you don't have a successful match. Um, and you can have loops in there, you have conditions, all these things. Um, if you pass the tag, up, tag table to the tagging engine plus the text, uh, then the tagging engine does its processing and it generates something called the tag list. Tag list is just a standard Python list. It has a, a very simple format. You can see that down here. Uh, the format is basically the first item in the tuple that you get for each match is the, is the tag object that you use in the, in the tag table. Um, the second and the third arguments are integers. And these are uh, sliced integers into your text. That's a very important thing in, in the uh, tag engine. It doesn't do any copy of the text. So you only work on your on the string that you pass in, and then you uh, you use slicing within the, uh, the string itself. So that's very memory efficient. If you have a large string, if you have a few hundred megabytes to, to parse there, uh, then you don't need to copy everything over and over again. Which is something I found that the Python parser, for example, does, and as a result, it uses a lot of memory. Right, and then. The last argument, which is not in this example, that is used for um, having recursive matching. So you can have a tag list there. Okay, so as I already said, it always works on slices, so you don't do any copying. You have a very complete matching command set, so you hardly, uh, well, well, basically you never need to go back to Python to do anything. Uh, you can write pretty much everything directly in the commands that you have available in the tag engine. Um, you can use arbitrary tag objects, uh, which is very convenient uh, when you design a parser. Uh, the API is very simple, it's actually just a single function. And uh, in MX 3.0 we added a JIT compiler 
to the uh, to the system. You don't really see anything of that because everything happens under the hood. It automatically converts all your tag tables into <coughs> an internal um, object. Does all the parsing up front, so you don't have to do it at runtime. So once you have the uh, the digit compiler work on your tag table, um, it then converts that into a very easily uh, usable format for the virtual machine that you have in the tag engine. And we have full universal support. This is an example of how you actually write a, a tag table in Python. So what you see here is that uh, you have these green strings in there. These are dump targets. So you don't have to do uh, complicated offset calculations anymore for the jumps. <coughs> then you have the, the standard format for the uh, tag table entries. You have uh, tuples where the first entry is um, the tag object that you want to assign to a matching Next slide. Second um, item in there is the, the tagging command. Those are actually integers, but uh, I added a few constants to make it more readable. Uh, so you have all the basic uh, commands that you, you need for matching. You have all in, you have all not in, so you can do uh, set matching. You can have you test where the character uh, corresponds to uh, a certain other character. Uh, and depending on the results of these uh, tagging commands, you can do jumps in your program. And the jumps um, are the, the last two arguments. The first one is for uh, it's a jumping offset in case the uh, string does not match, which is a more common case. So I put it uh, before the the other case, uh, which is the the matching case. And you can uh, just ignore these. Um, Ignore these these items if you don't. Uh, if you uh, can use the, the default, which is just to continue with the uh, with the next item in that tag table. Okay, so now I've given you uh, a short overview of the tagging engine and how it works. So you have three things to remember. First, first thing is uh, you have a tag table, which is the program that you put into the tagging engine. Um, then you have, you have tag objects that you use in the tag table. So you assign the tag objects to the slices that you match. And then the tagging engine creates the tagging list, which is uh, the output of the tag engine. And it contains the, the tag objects plus the slices that uh, did match. So I'm going to use that now to show you how to compile languages uh, using MX text tools. The general approach when parsing languages, um, just maybe a, a short uh, in between. If you have any questions, just ask. Yeah. But if there's something unclear, uh, then to, to ask now, then because we probably won't have time for discussions. Um, okay. So the general approach when, when compiling languages is you want to uh, you have it textual representation of your program, and compiling basically means you convert it to some other representation. So you have to make the, the compiler sort of understand what this your input text is all about, <coughs> and then work on it, and then generate some output. So the first thing that you do is you, um, you break up your input text into logical units. This is what you normally call tokens. So for example, the token would be uh, part of a, an integer literal, or part of a string literal, or uh, if you think of a, a class definition in Python, for example, you have various tokens for that. You have the, the word class, and then you have the name, and then you have parentheses, and then you have space classes, and colon. These things are tokens. Um, the parser itself then works on these tokens instead of on the string that you have there. And what you do is, uh, in, in the parts that you group, you try to group these tokens into syntax objects. So you uh, assign certain logic to each of these syntax elements that you have in your grammar. And then you uh, try to use that information to generate the, the new output out of those. And in general, you use uh, a tree logic for representing the, the relationships between the various uh, Syntax elements that you have in your uh, in your input, 
and this is called uh, the abstract syntax tree, which uh, previous speaker told us about. So, in fact, the, I think that the transformations that you're doing can actually be used in, in this approach as well. So, um, uh, the, the next item I have here, which is in gray because it's optional, is uh, you can manipulate that uh, abstract syntax, syntax tree once you've created it, and you can do all sorts of things like uh, optimize it or uh, have a different representation or group things in different ways, cut away yeah, things from There's the also always the problem of reinsertion of, of uh, fragments of, of the task tree into the task tree. So it has to be propagated uh, along a chain of nodes and so on. Right, right. Everything adjusted in the transformer. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to, to to get the right, the, the correct <coughs> Python task tree in the end. Right. Yeah. So there's also still some logics uh, under, under, under the hood. Yeah, it's yeah. certainly not easy to do the, the yeah. manipulations and transformations. Uh, but in any case, it's 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 an optional step. You don't have to do it. Uh, in some cases, you do need to do it. For example, if you want to optimize something, or uh, in case the output that you intend to generate uh, has a completely different logic than the input that you uh, that you want to parse. And then finally, to, to actually do the the generation of your uh, of the compiled form, you simply traverse the tree and you call methods on the tree, and then you collect all the output of these methods and you. Um, put them together, and you have your compiled form. Um, this is an example of AST. It's a very simple example. It's basically just a function call that you're doing. So as you can see, what you, you try to group everything uh, according to logic. You have uh, very high order uh, elements in there. The first one is the expression node, which would basically mean that you can parse any expression. Then you go one step down, which is a function call. Uh, the function call then consists of two um, uh, elements, the function name and the function parameters. And then for the function parameters, you have two different kinds here. You have the positional parameter and the keyword parameter, and uh, so on. As you can see, what, what you're doing there is you're using the divide and conquer approach for solving a problem. So you want to solve the problem of parsing an expression you simply break it down until you reach the, the very uh, basic elements uh, in order to solve it. The idea behind the, the AST uh, is that you basically encapsulate knowledge into the nodes that you have in the AST. So you put all the logic about parsing uh, tokens that you put into the, uh, the parser, into those AST nodes, plus you also put the output generation into those AST nodes. So this is, uh, this is a very fundamental thing that you have to do with ASTs. You try to put everything into, all the knowledge into those nodes, so you can use the, the generated tree as efficiently as possible. And the link to MX text tools and the tagging engine here is that what we're going to do is we're going to put the AST classes uh, into the, the tag table as tag objects. So what you then eventually get is you get a you get a, a tag list and the tag list has sublists and uh, so you basically have a tree structure there already and you use that tree structure to create the tag objects. The recipe for doing that is, is very easy. When you get a tag list from the, from the tagging engine, you uh, just iterate through the, the tag list, you instantiate all the classes that you have in there, you can pass any sort of information to those uh, objects. So for example, you can have the context information, the position within the tree, uh, the position within the string. Uh, you can put lots and lots of information there. You can pass it a context object, uh, which can be useful for, for example, in order to collect type information. Say you're parsing a function, and then you want to uh, see what, what, the, what the output type or types can be. And you can use that um, information in the context object and have the AST nodes basically propagate all the type information up to the higher level nodes. And then you can use that information to generate more optimized code later on. Um, the second step then is to call the parse method of these objects. And 
this whole thing works recursively. So what you do is you let the attack object itself do all the parsing. So you don't have any logic in your uh, in the attack tables themselves. You put all the parsing logic into the into these classes. And then if you have any tag items left, then you simply go to step one again. And you do that until you don't have any more elements in the tag list. Right, so you put all the information into your AST object. Okay, so this is a short summary of uh, how you parse languages with index and expect tools. Basically, first thing that you do is you define AST classes to re represent all your, your syntax elements. Um, then you define the, the tokens, how the tokens look, um, in the tag tables and you use the tagging engine then to do all the tokenization. You put the AST classes that you have defined into the tag table as tag objects, and then you have the tagging engine run over the whole thing and uh, tokenize your text, and at the same time associate the tag um, objects with the slices that you match. And because you know that you have AST classes in there, you can later on instantiate them and create uh, an AST from this tag list that you get there. And then finally you traverse the AST, uh, it's called an output method, or uh, whatever you call the method there to generate the, the output, and you collect the compiled output and have your compiled representation. <coughs> right, so actually I have, do have a bit of time left. Do you have any questions? Examples. <laughs> <laughs> examples, yeah. Um, well, I showed you this example. This one. Um, if you can just look at it, memorize it now, and then you can jump <laughs> to the. <laughs> um, basically, what this does is it, it tries to um, mark text in the input string as lowercase and uppercase. So you're not interested in any other character that you have in the string, you just want to see which is lowercase, which is uppercase. Uh, what you do there is you first pause on your lowercase characters. If they don't match, you jump to the next item uh, in the tag table, and you check whether it's an uppercase character. If it's not, you continue down to the skip section. The skip uh, section then parses everything that's not a character and consumes those, but it doesn't generate a tag list entry because you have a none here. That's, I forgot to mention that. If you, have, if you put a none there, then it, it simply means... Uh, plus one means the next. Uh, yeah, plus one goes to the next item in the, in the list there. Um, if you have a none there, then it doesn't generate a tag list entry, so you only get a lowercase and uppercase entries in your tag list. And then down here, you check for the end of file, which is the end of the string. And in case you do have the end of file, then uh, uh, you end with this example. This example, by my question was uh, essentially, why you did, uh, what was the motivation for this and what in the practical life uh, when did you use this uh, um, I'm, project, I guess? I'm using this for, uh, well, originally I used it for, for parsing HTML uh -huh. um, and doing very fast manipulations in HTML, doing search and replace, um, using MX text tools, for example, changing all the links in, in an HTML document to something else or processing them. Uh, more recently, uh, I'm using this to, to actually parse a macro language, which is similar to what you have in Excel, Excel VBA. And it works really nicely. So I'm using exactly this approach that I have here with the ASTs and generating the ASTs uh, this way, and then uh, passing the, determining all the type information, passing that back. And it works really nicely. So the, sorry. Why is there a plus one in the lowercase line, but no plus one in the uppercase line? Kind of uppercase line. Ah, because, uh, well, you could put plus one there as well, because the, the skip that you have there basically just jumps here, which is exactly the same as doing a plus one. The, the first entry that oh, you have there... Oh, it skips to the line above the next, right. the uppercase line. Right, to, to the next line. So just to show you some output, Quite a few more slides here, but you can show them. This is um, 
how attacked this looks. So it's not very impressive, but the numbers got the tags in there, lowercase, uppercase. That's the string up there that I'm, I'm parsing. And then because this is hardly readable, I have this, um, this help function in there, which then outputs the tags and the slices in your text. Yeah? So you can see that it does the right thing. Right, any more questions? Yeah? How is this compared to the declarative approach for parsing language? How hard? I mean, doing recursion, other things that usually get left recursion, right recursion, things that get complicated sometimes. How how easy is this approach? You can you can do all these things because you have recursion in the in the tag tables. You can you have something called a subtable command, so you can jump to a different table and have it match something, uh, and then use those results. You can you can unwind. You can do. Uh, Look ahead and look back. You can jump in your text if you want to. You can jump in, in the program, of course. So you can do all these things if you, if you need to. Plus, you can always call back to Python and use regular expressions if it's. A group. A grouping, yeah. Well, the. Basically, what you have here, the uh, the tags that you have here are the groups, yeah. and then um, but bigger groups, 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 groups. yeah, you can have groups of groups, of course, because in this example we don't have that because I don't use subtables, yeah. But we so have lots of nuns here, um, but the, the nuns can be tag lists themselves, yeah. and you can use that for grouping uh, to any level. Yeah. If I can ask you things by using Bartel, Bartel is a system where you can build your regular expressions on and build more complicated systems on top of it. It's more powerful than regular expressions. You can do the sorts of, as you were saying, bulk yeah. over with deep building with large tree structure. But I found it's, it's harder to use. I guess more powerful, but it's harder to use than using regular expressions to do optimization. Anything else? No? If you have questions, just come to me and we can discuss that. Thank you.